Great, we're going to read now before Liam comes up to speak to us. And the reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4. Listen to the word of the Lord. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, City Church. It's really great uh, to see you. Um, hope you had a lovely Christmas. Hello to you guys watching at home. Hope you're enjoying the uh, cold turkey sandwiches. Um, and as Ralph said, this is the, the first in our new mini sermon series, If You Could Ask God One Question, where you guys have had the chance to decide, you voted on these big topics that you want us to look at. These are some of the big questions that people um, are asking about Christianity. And I want to start off by saying that it is completely okay to be asking questions. We encourage that as a church. There's no assumption of, of what you should think or, or maybe what you should know. At City Church, we've got people who have been Christians for decades and then people who have been Christians just for weeks. We want people to be asking questions. That's why we have things like Alpha. You would have hopefully seen one of these on your seats when you came in. That's an online course that's happening in the new year. And it's a great way to be asking some of the big questions uh, that you may have about life. And our question for today is, can I trust the Bible? And um, so I'll quickly pray for us before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, Christmas, Lord. Thank you for what we were able to enjoy um, and celebrate, Lord. And we, we thank you for your word, the Bible. Thank you that it shows us life. And I pray that you would give us wisdom and insight as we think about this question, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the Bible is one of the most influential books of all time. With over 5 billion copies sold, it is the best-selling book of all time. So that's a good little pub quiz knowledge for you there. It underpins our society and our culture. Here's how Time magazine described it. They said, simply put, the Bible is the most influential book of all time. It has done more to shape literature, history, entertainment, culture than any book ever written. Its influence on world history is unparalleled and shows no signs of abating. Even pop culture is deeply influenced by the Bible. Well, the question is, it may be hugely influential, but can we trust the Bible? That's the question that we're thinking about today. It is a massive question, isn't it? There's, there's so much scope that we could think about it. Maybe for you, that, that's your impression of the Bible, like we were thinking about earlier with what Katie said. The Bible's just full of these crazy stories. How can I take that seriously? Hasn't science disproved some of these stories? You might agree with um, the actor, Sir Ian McKellen, when he said... I've often thought that the Bible should have a disclaimer in the front saying, this is fiction. Or maybe for you, it's the history of the Bible. Hasn't it all just been kind of cobbled together to suit someone's agenda? Maybe for you, it's you're reading the Bible and you're just finding it really difficult with some of the things that come up against it. You, you find it really hard. It, it kind of seems a bit outdated. And so for that reason, you're saying, I can't trust this. Now, there's lots of angles that we can think about this question and definitely more than we can cover in detail today. So what I'm hoping to do is to try and map out this question, like give it a little bit of a bird's eye view. And then hopefully that will give you a good launch pad to think about these questions a little bit more. So to try and cover all bases, we're going to be thinking about three questions today. That will, there may be the kind of things that stop you giving the Bible a chance. Is the Bible relevant? Is it reliable? 
And is it true? So firstly, is the Bible relevant? For some of you, that really may be the important issue. You might be saying, do you know what? I'm not interested in the historical reliability of it. I'm more interested and more bothered by what the Bible says. You might have questions about some of the events of the Bibles. It's a, a bunch of mad stories. People, you know, back then, they, they weren't particularly intelligent. They don't know what we now know. We're now smarter, more scientific, more enlightened as a society. You know, we wouldn't kind of fall for those same things. It, it can all be explained now. And Matt's going to be thinking a little bit more about that topic in a couple of weeks with the question, hasn't science disproved God's? But the problem with this attitude, it can lead to, to something called like a, a chronological snobbery. So chronological, just anything to do with time. And C.S. Lewis, the author, uses this term to think about how we can be tempted to kind of look down on other points of history. You know, and we judge them, we're, we're better than them. We're, we're wiser, we're more advanced, we're more knowledgeable than previous generations. And we can run the risk of judging them before we've even given them a chance. Now, it's helpful for us to think about, well, what the Bible actually is. And sometimes, I, I don't know, maybe we can think about it like a little bit like a, a cosmic rule book that's been given to us that tells us what's right and what's wrong. And our job is to read it a little bit like uh, one of you know, Aesop's fables, you know, the tortoise and the hare. I need to work out what the, the moral of the story is, what the big life lesson is, and apply that to my life. But the Bible is so much more than that. It's one book, but it's also a collection of 66 different books. And that's a, a library of loads of different genres of writing. So you've got lots of like, historical accounts in there, but there's some poetry, some, some, something called wisdom literature, like Proverbs. You've got letters from one person to another in there. You've also got um, biographical accounts of people's lives. And all of that is written into different points in history, different circumstances and situations. And you also get the personality of the author coming through in the writing. So that means that we read the Bible depending on what genre it is. You know, think about it this way. You wouldn't read a novel like Harry Potter in the same way that you would read um, a poem or, you know, a cookbook, a Lego manual, um, an Ikea manual, whatever it is. They all have different purposes with how you read them. But the Bible is one overall story as well. It has storylines that are overarching and run through the entire book. They help us to make sense of ourselves and the world around us. One of the main things the Bible does is that it holds up a mirror to ourselves. And through that, we get an insight into what it is like to be human. And that's really important to note that when we read the Bible, we might come across things in it that we find really difficult. The Bible does touch on some really dark areas, you know, there's mentions of like murder, genocide and slavery in there. Yet as we look at humanity, we know that humans are capable of good and bad things. And just because they're included in the Bible, doesn't mean that they are encouraged or, or condoned by God. Sometimes, like, like any novel, the Bible relies on the fact that you've read other parts of the story. So one part of the story might help us to make sense of another. That's why when we, we take isolated bits out of the Bible and maybe take it about out of context, we run the risk of missing out on its original meaning. The Bible gives us the context through which we need to read it. Do you know, maybe lots of you here are kind of new to reading the Bible. You're not really sure how it all kind of works and fits together. Can I recommend a book called God's Big Picture? It's super helpful on this. I've read it a few times and it is always really helpful in just seeing how the Bible fits together as one big story. But maybe your objection is, well, well Liam, have you, have you actually seen what the Bible says? You know, can I really take that seriously? Maybe it was relevant for them then back in history, but, but not for us now. We're a more civilized society, aren't we? I want you to hear me clearly in this. I'm not going to shy away from the fact that it, 
in lots of ways, it can be really difficult and really painful sometimes to hear what the Bible says. There are bits that feel aggressive and, and hard for our, our 21st century ears to hear. They might be the types of bits that just, just put the nail in the coffin for you. The Bible is not relevant for us. I can't trust it. And these bits, they are really hard. And we are right to ask questions about them. If that describes you today, like, you know, I really encourage you, please do keep on asking those questions. There are probably too many of these kind of areas and questions for us to go through today. But let me just note kind of one thing for us to think about when we're, we're thinking about those kind of difficult areas. We need to, to know and remember that the way that we approach these things are like our morality, basically, you know, what we see as right and wrong. That is always going to be shaped by our culture around us. So that might be, you know, where we're from, our kind of a background. But that also includes the, the era, the time of history that we're in. So 2020, the 21st century. And, and that is so ingrained in just our worldview, the way we see things. It's, it's a little bit like the air that we breathe. It's invisible, we can't see it. And often, most of the time, we don't really even stop to think about it. And so we, we see and we can hear things through that 21st century lens. So when we read something in the Bible that we find quite difficult, we might just automatically assume, I'm right, therefore the Bible is wrong. We reject what it says. So another example of this chronological snobbery like we were thinking about before, where we judge and, and, and look down on other points of history. We are right and they are wrong. But, I mean, I speak for myself and I imagine I speak for every kind of Christian in here. There are parts in the Bible that perhaps sometimes we, we just wish they weren't there. Maybe if it, if it just didn't have that certain bits, it would just be a little bit easier to swallow. And lots of those are, are really deeply kind of emotive and, and can be painful topics. When we read about hell, for example, it sits with us uncomfortably that some of our friends and our family who aren't Christians are going there based off what the Bible says. That's really hard to hear. Uh, and Ralph's going to be thinking about that question next week. So I'd encourage you that if you're reading bits of the Bible and you're finding it hard, please do persevere, keep on going. But keep on asking questions. Maybe share them with someone, maybe a friend or your connect group leader. Don't just kind of do it by yourself. Make sure you're asking those questions and really wrestling with what the Bible says and trying to understand it more. Well, secondly, you know, we're going to look at, is it reliable? You know, you might think, well, the, the Bible is surely unreliable. It's an ancient old document. How can we believe what it says? It's been edited, corrupted over time. You know, a little bit like Chinese whispers where every time something gets added or, or changed, you might resonate with what uh, the scientist Richard Dawkins says. He described the Bible as a chaotically cobbled together anthology of disjointed documents. Composed, revised, translated, distorted, and improved by hundreds of anonymous authors, editors, and copyists. Now, we're going to be historians for a second and think through, well, how was the Bible recorded? So it was written on um, papyrus or parchment, basically, you know, an ancient form of paper made either from kind of reeds or sometimes even goatskins, basically stretched out, dried in the sun. You know, this is before like the printing press for books was invented. So what people would do is that they would write out copies of things and then, you know, to circulate them, they would pass them on and it involved this process of writing them out and copying them. Now, if you want to kind of look at how the Bible was put together, you can look at it later, but there are two key questions for testing the reliability and accuracy of, of any of these kind of ancient documents from this era. You want to ask how many copies are there and when are they dated to compared to when the original was written? You see, the, the more copies there are, the more reliable it is. And the less time between the copies and the original, uh, the less likely it is for there to be error in them being copied and passed on. Now, if we look at the numbers for this, the Bible more than handles itself in this area. 
For example, there's over 24,000 existing copies just from the New Testament. And those are either kind of fragments of books or sometimes even whole full copies. You might know that, in fact, we have one of the very earliest pieces of the New Testament in our city. A fragment of John's Gospel found, you know, kind of 10 minute walk away on the John Rylands Library in Deanscape. And if, if you had the, the, the time and probably a lot of time for it, you'd, you could put all these copies together side by side and compare them and see how accurate they are together. And there's very few kind of variations or changes in the, in the grammar or the punctuation for them. Well, that, that might kind of trigger a little bit of a kind of red flag for you and think, well, why are there variations? Surely that's a little bit suspicious, isn't it? Well, imagine if I got all of you guys sat here and all of you kind of watching at home, I gave you a book and you had to copy it out exactly word for word. And then you had to share that with people in your life and they had to copy it out word for word and so on. A little bit like a ripple effect, people copying it, passing it on. And so like years down the line, if I got one of those copies and compared it to the original book, naturally I might expect just to see a couple of errors, tiny differences, maybe, you know, kind of from handwriting and things like that. But as the Bible has been copied, there's nothing that has dramatically kind of changed its meaning. Another reason for, for confidence is that some of the earliest copies are dated just 15 years after they were originally written. Now, that, that doesn't sound very impressive to us, does it, really, where we can make a copy of something in a microsecond, retweet, and there it goes. But maybe it's helpful for us to compare it to like another ancient document around that time, a poem called the Iliad by a, a Greek uh, poet called Homer. This is widely accepted as a historical document. And in comparison to like the thousands of copies that we have from the Bible, the Iliad only has 600 copies. The earliest is dated 500 years after writing. There's a historian called uh, John Montgomery, and for the New Testament, he puts it a little bit like this. To be skeptical of the resultant text of the New Testament is to allow all of classical antiquity, so the word antiquity just meaning all ancient books and texts and so on, to slip into obscurity. For no documents of the ancient period are as well attested bibliog bibliographically, that's a long word, as the New Testament. Basically, to put it simply, if you're going to reject the Bible because of historical accuracy, then you're going to have to reject all books from that era if you're applying the same criteria to them. So that means that we can more than use the Bible as a historical document. Just like we might use any historical document from that time to look into historical figures like Julius Caesar, for example. The final thing we're going to think about is, is it true? You might be saying, never mind whether it's reliable or not. Is it true? Couldn't what we be reading just be a bunch of made up stories? Well, let's think about how these kind of stories, particularly from the, from the New Testament, were, were written down. And so for this, you know, we, Ralph read it earlier, where we looked right at the start of a book called Luke. This is a, a gospel, basically a biography, uh, an account of Jesus' life. And Luke is the author, and he's basically, in these verses, he says why he wrote that book. So I'm going to read those kind of verses one to four again. He said, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Well, straight away, we can see that Luke is writing to a guy called Theophilus, and we can see how he's gone about writing the book. He has carefully investigated everything. Luke is incredibly concerned with truth and reliability. And you can see that throughout his gospel. There's loads of markers that appeal to historical accuracy. So let me share an example with you. One is from just Luke chapter two. It's a famous part of the Christmas story just before Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem. Uh, I think we read it, had it read in our carol service as well a couple of weeks ago. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. 
Now, we might read over that and think, well, you know, they're not particularly important, but that's a really helpful little historical marker that gives us an indication of when these events were happening. And throughout the Bible, there's loads of different details about different people and places which help us to work out where we are in history. For example, in Luke, he has incredible attention to detail. All of the ones he uses are accurate and right. And this book is written 40 years after Jesus, so many of the eyewitnesses to those events would still be alive. Basically, these events were written in living memory for those people. There's, there's no time for maybe the, the events to become like inflated, in, in, embellished a little bit like Chinese whispers and, and turn into these false and fake legends or myths. Maybe it's helpful. Think about it this way. It's a little bit like asking you guys to, to ask a parent or a grandparent to, and asking them, what were the 1980s like? Maybe, you know, for any fans of The Crown out there, it's like thinking about asking someone who was there, what was the wedding of Charles and Diana like? There's a few other things that support what the gospel say. Maybe we could look at the, the archaeology of it. Uh, and a famous example of this is from John chapter 5, where Jesus heals a paralyzed man in a pool near somewhere called the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. And this was largely rejected, saying, well, oh, there's no evidence for where this gate happened until archaeologists discovered this very pool and uncovered where this event took place. And for those who might say, well, isn't it a bit of a kind of inside job? Well, we can also look at historians from outside of the Bible from that era and see what they say about Jesus. And what they do say corroborates and supports what the Gospels say. Now, unless you've got like a really niche, nerdy interest in first century history, you may not have heard of these people, but you've got historians at that time, like uh, Pliny, Josephus, Tacitus, who, who all mentioned Jesus, some of the events that he did, uh, and lots of other historical figures from that time. Let me give you just a quick example from a guy called Josephus. He, well, you can see what he says about Jesus. He says, at that time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. And those who became his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported he had, been, he had appeared to them after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets had recounted wonders. Well, this leads us on to two helpful things when we think about whether or not the Bible is true or not. First of all, you, you might have all, all heard that phrase, history is written by the winners. Basically meaning history is written by the people who have authority, power, control. Yet yeah, when we read accounts like this and about Jesus' life from the Gospels, this is history written by the losers. The early Christians and followers of Jesus were persecuted that means that they would face lots of opposition for following Jesus. There was nothing to be gained from following Jesus at that time. In fact, it was better just have nothing to do with him. You can read uh, the book of Acts just in the New Testament and see what life was like for some of these early followers of Jesus. 10 out of 11 of Jesus' disciples were martyrs, basically killed for their faith and believing in Jesus. They died because of the very words that we now read in our Bibles. That leads us on to a simple question, doesn't it? Would you die for a lie? Would you die for something that you knew was false and wrong? I doubt there is any one of us here or watching at home that would ever do that. Secondly, we can, we can look at these gospel accounts and, and see how these disciples and the early writers talk about themselves. Maybe try and put yourself in those shoes. You're this small bunch of kind of misfit, ragtag bunch of Middle Eastern fishermen who, who have this life-changing news about Jesus and they, they need to take it out to this hostile world that opposes them. So, you know, if you're, if you're trying to convince people and you're trying to get people's confidence in you, then maybe you'd think you know, how to portray yourself and portray yourself in a bit more of a positive light so people believe you. Maybe you portray yourself like a really heroic figure. But if you've read any of the Gospels, we know that 
the disciples, they, you know, they're often portrayed a little bit hopeless, sometimes haphazard, and, and sometimes even a little bit stupid. So why would you stand by claims like these, especially with the persecution you would face, if all you're doing is lying and just trying to convince people? Many of the events in the Bible would have had huge crowds there. They're public events, many people watching. So if this is all made up by the early Christians, then people at the time, maybe that's the Roman or Jewish leaders, would have easily kind of investigated and dismissed these claims and just said, well, no, that didn't happen. People wouldn't have believed them. The truth is there was nothing to be gained. No power or money could be gained from lying. In fact, it was very much the opposite. If you followed Jesus, you made life 10 times worse for yourself. So that question is, why would you make it all up, present yourself in such a stupid way, and be prepared to stand by it to the point of death, unless it was all really true? Now I'm nearly done, but let me leave you with this thought. You know, the question of, of what is true or not, and whether the Bible is true, is an absolute vital one. You might have heard this term, we live in a post-truth world where the idea of truth is constantly being ripped up, changed and reset. And truth now becomes what, what you decide it to be. Whatever feels true for you. But the radical nature of what the Bible claims and, and who Jesus is means that we have to have a look for ourselves. It can't be a case of subjective interpretation. You know, that, that's true for you, but not for me. If the Bible is reliable and true, then it is relevant for you, for all of us. In fact, its words carry more relevance and more meaning than anything that you could ever read. We heard earlier on, didn't we, that the Bible is a story. And perhaps uh, the greatest tool for interpreting this story is its focal point, you know, what, what's at the center? What is this story built on? And that central topic is a person, it's Jesus. Throughout the book, there are, there are traces and arrows that point to him from the very first chapters of the book right to the end. Jesus is the lens in how we read the entire Bible. He is the hero that, that captures what this entire story of 66 books is all about. And Jesus even acknowledges this about himself. There's a moment in John's Gospel where he's speaking to the Pharisees. These were men who, who studied the Old Testament, but they missed the very subject that all of it pointed to. This is what Jesus said. He said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them, you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. The Bible is a story of a God who created the world and not just created it and saw that it was messy and just left it to, to kind of happen, but he stepped into this world like we celebrate at Christmas and he became a baby. He became like us. He took on this human messiness so that he could know us intimately and to show us how much he loves us. In Jesus' words, he came to bring us life. The author C.S. Lewis famously described the Bible as a true myth. Now, not a myth like a bunch of stories that are kind of false and all made up, but a myth is in a story and a true story of that, a story that really happens, a true story that helps us to make sense of the world and who we are in it. And we know that's true if we've looked at the Bible. In the Bible, we can see reflection of our, our hopes, our dreams, our fears, our worries, our desires, what we long for deeply as human beings. We see ourselves in the story, but most importantly, we see Jesus. 
So the Bible is not only a story that is reliable, relevant and true, but it is also beautiful and good. And I encourage you, wherever you're at, keep on asking those questions. Keep on looking into what the Bible is. Keep on looking into it so that you see more and more of Jesus. Let me pray for us to finish. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for, for what we heard about it early on with, that Ralph was reading, that it refreshes our soul. It gives us life. It shows us who you are and how much we need you. Lord, we thank you for how it shows us Jesus, this, this baby that came into our world and that would eventually die for us so that we might have eternal life. And Lord, uh, I thank you just for this time that we've had to think about this question, whether or not it's reliable and true. Lord, I pray that you would help us, if we have any questions, just to look into those more and more uh, and to see how wonderful, how beautiful and amazing you are through it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.